Um, hi, if we haven't met, I'm Phil. I uh, created the uh, original PureScript compiler and you know, I continue to work on it. Uh, I'm going to give an overview uh, of the PureScript type system specifically. So, um, just the type system, you know, PureScript, uh, the, the entirety of PureScript is kind of a big topic to present in like an hour, I suppose. So, I'm just going to focus on the type system. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some stuff that we nabbed from Haskell um, that you are probably familiar with if you've used Haskell, um, and some stuff that we have that Haskell doesn't have as well. Okay, um, so I'm not going to give sort of um, an introductory, an introductory uh, sort of talk on, on pure scripts. If you know Haskell a little bit, you'll sort of see what's going on with uh, the, the few bits of code that I have. Um, but the, the very, very high level quick summary is that PureScript is a small, strongly typed programming language that compiles to JavaScript. It's heavily inspired by Haskell. It's written in Haskell. Um, and it's uh, specifically designed to target the web and uh, uh, you know, front-end development specifically. Um, so you can learn more at purescript.org or on um, the PureScript channel on either <coughs> uh, Slack, the FP Slack, um, you know, organization, which is probably the, the best place. And then there's a PureScript IRC channel on Freenode as well. Um, so the goals I had, um, oh, I should just say, by the way, stop me if you have questions. I don't have that many slides, so, uh, yep. Um, as an introductory comment, can you uh, say a quick uh, word about uh, contrast with the ESSA, uh, ups or downs? Well, I can, I can talk about, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, contrast with like Haskell specifically, like in just, in, I mean, Haskell generally, you know, um, as a language. Um, and then I'll talk, I guess, a little bit about Yeso. But um, so the major difference between Haskell and PureScript is that Haskell is, uh, is that PureScript is strict, Haskell is non-strict. Okay, so um, that has a lot of repercussions um, in terms of like, you know, the way you write code. If you write in a, you know, lazy, if you're writing a strict functional language, a lot of the idioms don't directly translate over, but there's still a lot of things you can take from Haskell and bring over to PureScript and be productive. Um, there's a few other differences. Uh, mostly, that I can summarize it as saying, you know, PureScript was built specifically with the web in mind, right? So, um, you know, it's a strict language. It's, it compiles to really sort of readable JavaScript on purpose. Uh, yeah. Uh, those are the main things, but I'm going to talk specifically about some of the differences in the type system in a little bit anyway. Um, comparing to Yasode, if you're not familiar, Yasode is a uh, web framework for Haskell. You would write a more traditional sort of um, back-end driven you know, web application using Yasode. PureScript tends to focus more on the front end. You can write back-end applications in PureScript, but uh, you'd be more likely to write like a single page application in PureScript than do something like you would with Yasode. Okay. Um, answer your question yeah okay cool um, so yeah please interrupt with uh, with questions because I don't have that much material to get through um, yeah so just quickly a little bit about the goals that I had in mind with PureScript um, I wanted to build a language that I wanted to use every day um, at the time I wrote it I was using TypeScript and JavaScript um, there were a lot of alternatives for writing uh, strongly typed uh, compile, jo compile to JavaScript languages like uh, Roy was probably one of the ones that I took the most influence from. Uh, what else? So now there's things like Flow, there was Elm at the time that was just getting started, JCJS, Haste. Um, none of them really did exactly what I wanted, so I tried to sort of piece together, you know, the rudiments of exactly the language I wanted. And uh, then we got a lot of contributors, and now it's obviously a much bigger language. Um, to explore how types can improve web programming. Um, was one of the goals to try out just some new type system ideas. Uh, one of the stated goals of GHC is that it should be sort of a playground for new type system ideas, that researchers should be able to take their, you know, their new idea for a lazy, compiled, uh, strongly typed functional language and just add it to GHC and see how it works. So I wanted a similar sort of thing for pure scripts where you could just, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you knew how to build a Haskell project, you could just sort of try something out. Um, and make progress with, with ideas really quickly. Um, and as well, just have a fun project for uh, you know, people who are new to open source Haskell. So um, if you're interested in joining the PeerScript community, there's a lot of sort of small tasks that, you know, interesting small tasks that can, you know, to be done on the compiler. Uh, if you want to contribute to an open source, like a major open source Haskell project, um, there's a whole bunch we can help you get started with. 
basically just have to know how to build a project with Stack, um, and you can get started. Okay, um, so quick agenda. Uh, I'm going to recap some Haskell extensions that uh, some of them are pretty common, um, some you might not have seen in a while, so we'll just go over them. Um, talk about the implementation of the type system a little bit and, and those features, uh, how they get implemented just at a high level in the PureScript compiler. Um, I'll give a couple of quick demos of some features that we have in PureScript that we don't have in Haskell. Um, and then I'll just talk a little bit about some ideas for type system features um, thanks. Uh, that we would like to add, ideally before like a 1.0 release. Okay, so a few Haskell extensions, or just features I suppose to begin with. Um, so hopefully everyone's seen type classes before. Um, a lot of the features I'm going to talk about <coughs> sort of build on type classes pretty extensively, but uh, the basic idea is that we want to capture like predicates on types, right? So if I want to talk about types that, uh, types A that have um, decidable equality, right? I can test equality of two values of type A, um, then I can build a type class called eek for equality to do that, right? And, uh, so I have a class called eek, it has one type parameter A, and it's built out of a method called eek with a lowercase e. Uh, that takes two values of type A and returns a boolean that tells me if they're equal or not. Okay. Um, and instances attach, uh, basically assert that a type is, uh, you know, a predicate holds for a certain type. Okay. Um, so this instance called eek boolean uh, inhabits the eek type class for the boolean type, just true and false. Okay. And it's implemented using pattern matching. True is equal to true, false is equal to false, and everything else is not equal to everything else. Okay. Um, and one basic but really useful feature of type classes is that you can um, you can use type classes to uh, you can build type class instances out of old type class instances, right? So if I want eek for lists, well, I can give you a I can give you a quality a sensible definition of equality for any uh, list type as long as the elements themselves have a sensible definition of equality. Okay, so I can say that I have an instance called eek list for eek of list a whenever, and that's what this, uh, this arrow here means, whenever I have an instance for eek on a. Okay. Uh, any questions on that, first of all? So yep. uh, we all just got a meet up thing that someone's trapped downstairs. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to fly through some of these uh, ideas from Haskell, right? So another one that we borrow from Haskell that uh, a lot of languages don't have is higher kinded types, right? So um, <clears throat> in PureScript and languages like PureScript, you can write these data type declarations, right? Where you have a data type and then a bunch of type arguments, um, and then you can use them to build your data type out of those type arguments, right? But crucially, um, in PureScript and Haskell and a few other languages, the arguments don't have to actually be types, right? They don't have to represent types. They could represent uh, type constructors, so they could be functions that take types to other types, as an example, right? So this is an example where A here is a type, right? So uh, for example, I can construct this free thing from with this pure constructor by just giving you a value of type A. But F isn't a value, right? F is, uh, F is sorry, F isn't a regular type, like a type of values. F is a representation of a type constructor. It takes types and gives me new types back. Okay, so I can apply f to a type and get a new type. Um, so for example, I could apply free to list, which is not a type itself, but it's a list, uh, a list of a is a type, okay? Um, list is a type constructor. Okay, so when we, when we have the ability to uh, talk abstractly about type, you know, type constructors or type constructor constructors and what have you, um, then we say we have, uh, higher kinded types, okay? Because uh, we can classify the different sorts of type constructors using this notion called kinds. So how do you know, looking at the signature, that in free, F, in free FA, mm -hmm. F is a constructor? <clears throat> right, so what's happening here is we have essentially type inference going on one level up at the type level inferring kinds, right? So just like types track the types of values, sorry, just like types characterize values, um, you know, int is different from string, um, kinds characterize types and type constructors, okay? So the kind of a list is a different thing from the kind of integers, for example, right? One is a type, one is a type constructor, so we classify them with kinds. And we can do kind inference just like we can do type inference. So what happens here is when I type this declaration in, 
kind inference works out, even though I didn't write this as a type constructor, the compiler can figure out, well, you applied it to a type, and you gave me back something that was in a type position, so it has to be a type constructor. Huh. Okay. What happens yeah. if there are multiple mm -hmm. kinds for which it would be, for which it would right. work out? Right, um, so there's, there's some extensions t uh, in Haskell, like uh, polymorphic kinds, right, the polykinds extension, which lets you um, do similar sorts of kind inference, you know, for types that you would want to do for, value, for polymorphic values. So like, like we can have polymorphic types, uh, or parameterize over polymorphic types and all these things, maybe we want to do the same things at the kind level. PureScript doesn't have polykinds, but uh, you can do some of that stuff in Haskell. Uh, I'd like to add polykinds eventually, but we don't so have any. So if you don't specify what kind it is, and there are multiple kinds that will work, does it just assume it just, kind is type? It just defaults to star, yeah, type, okay. yeah, exactly. Um, I've tried a couple of times to get polykinds to work, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit tough to get the details worked out. Um, but yeah, it's on the list, so. Uh, okay, and just like, um, well, why do we care about this, right? Like why this is not just like, um, this, this is actually useful, right? So the reason is we can parameterize things like classes or functions, or the types of functions, also over higher kinded types, right? So I can write a map function for arrays, or I can write one for lists or binary trees, parameterize it over the types of the values in its leaves, right? Um, they're all similar sort of concepts, and they obey the same laws, right? So why, why should I not be able to write uh, one function that does, you know, has, uh, that implements all of those uh, mapping operations, right? And I can, uh, because PureScript allows my type class definitions to refer to uh, higher kinded types, right? So I can say functor f, the type constructor f is a functor if whenever you can give me a function from A to B, I'll give you a function back from containers f full of A's to containers f full of B's, okay? So I can implement this for lists, arrays, and whatnot, but uh, I can use it generically. Uh, any questions? So it's just, it just enables a, a you know uh, a new type of code reuse. Any questions on that? Or, um, is that an extension necessary in Haskell? Or is that <coughs> no, that that's uh, yeah, that just comes with Haskell ninety eight. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next feature we now have from Haskell is functional dependencies, right? And this is this is one of the this is one of my favorite features in PureScript because it has such like a high power to weight ratio, right? Like we didn't have to do all that much work to add it, but it enables so many things. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the things it enables. Um, so if type classes are like uh, predicates on types, right, then if I allow myself wait, multiple types. I got a person. Mm -hmm. Type classes are like predicates. Okay. So we said like the eek type class is like a predicate, right? Like a type may or may not have decidable equality. Well, the generalization of um, a predicate on a type is a relation on multiple types. So if I allow myself multiple type arguments here, then <clears throat> I can talk about relations between types and between type constructors and things like this, okay? So for example, in the MTL library in Haskell, there's this type class called monad state, which allows you to talk polymorphically, generically about uh, monad transformer stacks that support the state operations, okay? If I want, uh, if I, want a monad, if I want a monad that allows, my, allows uh, me to get and set a piece of mutable state, that might be the state monad, or it might be the state monad transformer transforming some other monad, right? There's lots of different monads that implement that interface. Um, and in general, we have this class to talk about them abstractly. And it's a relation between two types. Well, a type and a type constructor. Okay, so S here is the type of the state I care about mutating. Um, and M is the monad that I'm trying to state this monad contains this ability, right? Has this, uh, has the ability to modify the state. Now it turns out when you have relations between types and type constructors, it's often used to, useful to be able to say things like, compiler, if you can infer this type, then you can also infer the other type, right? Uh, if you're trying to solve this, if you're trying to find an instance for this and you only know about M, then this functional dependency says that you can figure out S, right? If you, if you choose an instance for M, then you can just take S to be whatever that instance says, said um, it should be, okay? You don't have to match M and S both. You could just match M and infer S, okay? So this is really powerful because it allows me to talk polymorphically about monads M 
and then not worry about like having to put type annotations on the state type because if I didn't have this functional dependency um, in some cases the compiler wouldn't be able to figure out which instance in some cases so functional dependency is like a really practical thing when you want to do things like use the mono transformer library but they also enable a whole bunch of other uh, really interesting things yep so um, if you're writing if, so only when you're doing inference so that's the case right if you were writing out the um, because the S comes before the M, so you couldn't like just give it oh. M without giving it. The yeah, S. so the order here doesn't doesn't matter. Okay. The the order on the right and the arrow, right? Uh, the direction of the arrow matters. Okay. Well, so this M says M determines S. That's that's for writing this type class instance, right? But if you were going to write mm -hmm. an implementer, mm -hmm. you'd actually have a particular S in mind. Is that what you're getting at? I guess so. Um, yeah, I should have probably written some a little bit of code to illustrate this, but it's sort of it's sort of tricky to see exactly why the compiler needs this information. But in some cases, you'll end up where you know you think it's so obvious that like it should have picked the monad state instance for like this particular monad, but it didn't because it couldn't like if we didn't have the functional dependency, the state type wouldn't have matched um, because I was using it like polymorphically or something. Um, yeah, in practice, it's just really handy to be able to talk about these relations this way. Does, um, this, does this state that when you create an instance of monad state that you have to make the S into that instance, or not? Um, or yeah, so typically you'd say something like, so you, as an example, M might be the state trans the state monad, right? State S. Um, in that case, I'd write something like monad, instance monad state of S for state S, right? And the compiler might know that, you know, it's, state I'm using state of something in which case it can infer the s must be whatever was inside state it has to be the same one um, okay so this is just useful for sort of uh, you know in practical terms for using things like the MTL but it's sort of much more general than that right um, really what's going on here is, is if we have a relation between two type arguments like this uh, from a relational point of view what we want to be able to say is this is actually not just a relation, but a function, okay? Um, it's functional in one direction, in the sense that uh, the, so what defines a function, right? If you have the, uh, which way around is it? I'm sorry, if you have um, two images in the, co in the domain, uh, no, I've forgotten, but uh, does anybody know enough relations to complete that? I forget. What, so, what is the question? That you're um, uh, so the, the point of a functional dependency is that like, this thing that I'm defining, this class, this relation between type arguments, is not just a like a relation. I can say more about it, right? I can say that it's actually functional. It's it's a functional relation. It it's like a function from one type argument to the other. Two different mm. S's will necessarily mm. mean two different M's. Right. Oh. If you have the same M, you have to have the same S. Oh, yeah. Okay. The other way around, I think. Yeah. No, 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 opposite if, of yeah. If you have two points in the relation and they have the same X coordinate M, you have to have the same Y coordinate S. Mm. Yeah. It sounds so, like you're sneaking mm. up on dependent. Um, given, so, given a type, I can give you back another type. So what I'm driving at is that like, we, can, we can start doing like, type level programming, right? So we don't have dependent types in the sense of actual types, you know, depending on values. But we have, it allows us to do, uh, you know, basic versions of a lot of the sort of things you would do in dependent type languages, like talk about, uh, you know, type level uh, natural numbers, write functions at the type level to add them together, and then say things like, if I have two lists and I can concatenate them, then the length of the result is the sum of the lengths of the inputs. And write that in the type system and have it checked for me. Mm. Right. So <clears throat> functional dependencies let us write type level functions. Okay. So here's a little definition of type level natural numbers. A type level natural can either be zero, which is Z, or it can be the successor of a smaller, it can be one plus a smaller natural number. Okay, which is the S constructor. So S of S of S of Z is one plus one plus one plus zero, which is three. That's how you'd represent three at the type level. And then using type classes with functional dependencies, right, we can write type level functions that relate relations between these things that are functional in those arguments. Right? So we can say, I have this add class that's a three-way relation between two inputs and one output. And if I know the two inputs, then I can infer the output. Okay. Um, so to, to implement this, I could say, oh, it looks like I actually didn't quite finish this. This should say, uh, if I add uh, zero to any n, I get n. And if I add a successor to m, 
then I get the successor of what I would have gotten if I'd have you know, just added n, right? So if n plus m is r, then one plus n plus m is one plus r, okay? So we can just build it up inductively on the left argument. Um, yeah, so. so that middle one is just 0.3. Sorry, say that again? So the middle expression is 0.3. No, I, um, I failed to uh, finish off the slide. Uh, it should say that. It should say, uh, if I add zero to uh, any n, I get the same n back. Yeah. Um, so you know, if this is just by sort of induction on the left argument, right? It's just uh, proving that we can implement addition uh, by induction on the first argument. Okay. Um, so you can do an awful lot with this, right? This gives you like a really rich uh, language at the type level to do some really cool stuff. Um, it gives us, so some people call this type level prologue, right? Because uh, if you look at uh, instances like this, you know, it's like saying, you know, I have this goal and goals can depend on other sub, sub goals, right? And, and I have this tree of goals that I have to satisfy. Um, and I'm, I'm just sort of declaratively stating, you know, how um, this set of rules and then the inference engine just figures out how the rules get put together in order to sort of implement what I want. I still don't understand the last statement of those three lines. Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is saying, so th is the first one clear? If you add zero to n, you get n. Yeah, so this one says if you add, so there's an implication here, right? This is like the sub goal. If this is true, then this is true. Okay, if you add n to m and it results in r, then adding the successor of n to m gives you the successor of r. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is like, a, you know, this is like the hello world of type level prologue, right? Um, and you can do a whole bunch of really cool stuff. So the first application we had for it was called uh, PureScript Generics Rep, which was a sort of reinvention of the generics library that we had for doing generic programming, right? If you're familiar with um, GHC generics in Haskell, uh, the way it works is that um, you have a type class called generic um, and it associates with via sort of an associated type you know, a representation for that type. And the idea is what? that, uh, so, so, like, so it reduces, so you have the types you want to program with, and then you have representations, right? And the idea is that the, rep the set of representation types should be much smaller than the set of actual types you work with in your day-to-day -day work, right? And if you can write... What's if, the difference between a type and a representation? Well, so just think of a representation as like a smaller set of types that sort of like represents all the types you could, you know. So types are built out of things like sums and products and, you know, uh, very, you know, very small, a uh, small set of constructors, right? Let's call those representations. If I can write a program generically for any one of the representations, then I should be able to write it for all of my, all of my data types. Right? So that's the idea with GAC generic. Um, so we don't have associated can you, can you types. Give an example of that? Yeah. Okay. So let's say I want. So take the eek, the eek type class, right? That I had before. Um, eek instances are often really boilerplatey, right? Because you write them all exactly the same way. If the type you have is a product of two smaller types, then all you have to do is check that both components are equal. If it's a sum of two smaller types, all you have to do is check. Are they both in the same sum and, right? Are they both at the left or are they both at the right? And if they are, check equality on the sub thing, right? the smaller thing inside. Okay. And then, you know, I have equality for integers and all these primitive types, right? Strings, what have you. Um, so I can just lift it up that way, right? Like if I, if I have all my primitive types have equality and sums and products have it, then I can build up equality for all data types. So, th so my representations are like sums and products. If I can define equality on just those, then I can map over to the representation world write my equality instance, map back, and now I have an equality instance on my actual data type. Right, so that's, that's GHC generics in a nutshell. We can't do GHC generics in Haskell, in PureScript, because we don't have associated types like we do in Haskell. What's an associated type? An associated type is a type class that has a type uh, like associated with it, right? So, uh, uh, sorry, a, a type class whose instances have types associated with them. Okay? Can you get an example of that? Uh, uh, no, it's not really the point. <laughs> the, the point is functional dependencies allow us to express type functions and um, that's enough to be able to do generics rep because I can express the mapping from types to representations as my type function. Um, type and it, function is yeah. type just expressed as like a constraint? Yeah, exactly. So, so we, have a two, we have a two argument. Um, I mean, I can show you the code. Uh, can you just go back to slide or two? Slide. Right as you were flipping 
lines that I realized was constrained. Um, yeah, sorry, just one sec. Uh, generic. So that this is the uh, definition of the generic class. Okay, um, it has two arguments: an A, which is the type I care about, and rep, which is the representation type, and a functional dependency, which says if you know the data type, you know the representation. Okay, um, and then we have two functions here to go back and forward, right, from the values to the representation of those values and back to the original values. So if I want to define inequality, uh, well, what's a good example? Um, in this module, I have generic equality defined. Okay, so I have this other type class <coughs> called generic eek, and then I have this one implementation of equality that says if you have a type A that's generic with a representation, and the representation has generic equality, then I can implement equality for uh, the, f the thing you first thought of. Right? Um, so then, you know, there's a whole bunch of these things, right? You can implement show this way. You can implement Monoid, semi-group, um, odd instances, all sorts of stuff. So, is 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 your uh, representation? Is that like a? Is that purely at the type level, or is it, like is it a proxy, or is it some um, value that represents the representation? They have inhabitants, yeah. Um, yeah. So, if we go back to the first module, um, so here are some of the representations, right? No constructors says I don't have any constructors. No arguments says. You know, I have a constructor, but that constructor doesn't have any arguments. So uh, sums of types, product of types. Yeah. Is there any reason that that, I mean, because obviously you were talking about how uh, there's no associated types, so you can't have like a, mm -hmm. uh, the, the type representation, but couldn't you have a, um, just using functional dependencies, could you encode that exact same thing instead of using type families, using functional dependencies? Yeah, that's that's how we do it. Well, but the yeah. thing is that in 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 juicy generics, aren't all of the uh, aren't isn't all of juicy generics just at the type level? There's no inhabitants for any of the any of the types. Or um, I could just be totally wrong. Inhabited types. I think they're inhabited. Yeah. 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 Okay. Then I just don't know about juicy. So I, I did I did think about doing it that way. The problem is we don't have GADTs, right? Because what, what would be really nice is if you have like a kind of representations, right? And then you have the shape, just the shape, no values. And then you have a GADT, which essentially acts like it's singletons or whatever. Then you can just talk about the shape, which means you can do things like hash the type without having to have a value of the type around, things like that. Um, I suspect you can probably do that anyway. But um, anyway, so the major application of this initially was generics rep. Um, but now there's a whole bunch of like really interesting applications uh, using this for all sorts of interesting stuff. So um, uh, two of these, for example, by um, Liam Goodacre. Uh, the first one is uh, PureScript Type Map, which is an implementation of a full implementation of uh, the maps library from PureScript, like the dictionaries. Um, so balance two three trees implemented at the type level with functions like insert, delete, rotate. <laughs> Uh, expressed as uh, type level functions with functional dependencies. And then if that wasn't sort of crazy enough, then type lang is a full uh, interpreter for the uh, simply type lambda calculus implemented inside the type system using functional dependencies. And there's a whole bunch of these, right? What happens if you make the type checker go into an infinite loop? Um, it, it sort of, it tries, uh, it basically has a maximum sort of uh, depth in the in the solver, right? So um, if you get to like you know ten thousand depth, like you know uh, number of sub goals it's tried, then it just gives up and gives an error. Okay. So the next feature we nick from Haskell uh, is higher rank polymorphism. Um, so you might have seen types like this in Haskell. You know, for all a something like the identity type for all a a arrow a. Um, so higher rank polymorphism says, why don't we make that into a type in its own right where we can you know, put it anywhere inside a type, right? So not just on the outside, for all can appear inside types, right? So for example, one application of this in Haskell and PureScript um, is the ST monad, which is uh, a state, uh, so the, the, there's a paper that goes with this called lazy functional state threads. Um, and it's basically an alternative to things like the state monad uh, for uh, tracking mutable state, but in such a way that the type system lets you know that um, the mutation can't leak out of the function you're trying to define. Okay, um, and the way it does that is to use <coughs> higher rank polymorphism. Okay, so in the type of run st, we can think of st h a as being 
a computation of a value of type A, where I'm allowed to do mutation inside a sort of conceptual heap of type H, uh, uh, named by this type H. Okay? And the type says, I can remove the effects, right? I can let you get hold of an actual pure value of type A, um, as long as the computation is polymorphic in the actual heap. If you, can if you can sort of go and do your mutation, go and do the work, but you don't know like which part of the heap you actually mutated. Like if, if, you, if you're unaware like where the mutation was happening, then I can safely remove the polymorphism because you can't, this type variable can't leak out, right? You can't say, um, you know, for example, pass out a mutable reference to a value, right? This, this monad lets me sort of create, um, create references to mutable values, uh, read them, write them, modify them. Um, but this heap parameter gets tracked inside them, right? So I can, I can let pure values leak out, but because this is polymorphic, I can't let references leak out, and that's why it's safe. Okay. So there's lots of neat things you can do with this. Another, um, <clears throat> another cool thing you can do with this is sort of uh, information hiding, right? So uh, this is a little bit like uh, ex uh, existential types, if you've heard that term, right? So this, suppose I have some uh, interface, and I want to give you an implementation of that interface, but I don't want to tell you what the type was that implemented it. Okay. Um, so I can say, well, if, uh, you know, for any result type, I'll give you a result back if you can tell me how to produce a result for any choice of implementation. Okay. But you don't get to use knowledge of the implementation in comp you know, in outside this function. You, in, when you pass me this function that computes the result, um, you have to use it abstractly. I'll give you some interface with which to compute it, and I'll give you a proxy for the actual implementation type, but because it's polymorphic here, and not on the outside, you can't use that information in the, you know, to influence the, uh, the computation. Does that make sense? It's sort of, uh, this is a very, very high level summary of like, you know, so an entire Haskell is, extension, so. How would that be different from having the um, type constraint outside mm. of, like the first thing in your uh, type signature? Right, so if I said for all, Result and implementations, interface, impl, and then everything else was the same, right? So in that case, um, you know, I could call, uh, well, so for a start, when I call this hiding function, I need to know the implementation, right? The, but I don't want the caller to pick the implementation. I want the, uh, I want the function itself to pick the implementation. But I don't want, I don't want you to know what implementation I chose, yeah. Uh, do you also allow that for all uh, in positions that expect a type variable for yeah. something like uh, proxy impl? Could, could that so know? like in predicative types? Yeah, we do, and don't tend to talk about it too much because it usually like things just go badly wrong. But okay. uh, not like in the in it's not like you get bugs in the code or like it's not. Uh, I don't think it's unsound. Although I'd be interested if somebody like showed that it was. Um, it's just type inference is terrible, so uh, we don't tend to use it that way. But um, <clears throat> but there's no, there's no sort of syntactic restriction stopping you from doing that. So the question was, can you say things like array of polymorphic type, right? Can you have a polymorphic type inside a type constructor? And the answer is yes, but uh, you probably don't want to. Okay, uh, so next section, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about implementation of the compiler. Um, are people interested in hearing about the implementation of the compiler generally? Like, yeah, all right, cool. Um, any questions on the stuff so far? No? Okay. All right, so, yeah. So how exhaustive is this list of features? Is this kind of? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, um, that's a pretty much complete list of, you know, um, the really interesting stuff we took from GHC. There's more features that I haven't talked about yet that we have that Haskell doesn't have. And there's lots of features that Haskell has that we don't. Like we don't have GADTs, we don't have type families, and we don't have um, polymorphic kinds, right? Um, this, I think it would be nice to have some of those. I find this is like a really nice um, set of features for doing, you know, pure functional web programming, right? So if we don't add those features too soon, I, I wouldn't be, you know, it's not the end of the world. Like I think we have, especially functional dependencies, I think, like I say, adds a lot of power for, uh, quite a small feature. Um, I quite like the set of features we have at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, you, you're writing a language and a compiler, 
mm -hmm. that has a community of people that are using it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what your decision making process is when you decide you know, what am I going to what am I going to prioritize <coughs> added for? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I want it to be a little bit of a you know a place to try out new ideas, right? So, so to a certain extent, I don't want to um, throw out ideas because they're like too crazy or something, right? Like we should. But on the other hand, you know, as soon as you add a feature, somebody will go use it to make a library, and then you can't remove it, right? So, um, <clears throat> so I don't really have a great general answer to that. Just um, if something seems like it has, you know, it's going to be useful generally. Um, We'll discuss it. We we have you know a lot of the contributors will like get involved on the GitHub issues and say I'd use it for this. I think this is you know a bad feature, or whatever. And then we we decide whether to merge it or not. And we have um, you know the issue tracker just generally tracks uh, stuff we're interested in implementing. And then you know it's unusual that somebody just comes along and like look I made this feature like it's fully formed, ready to merge, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so usually like people have an idea of the sorts of things we're interested in. Um, does that answer your question? Like, it does. Yeah. I'm, I'm just very curious coming from, you know, I'm, I'm more used to focusing time on developing a product that has a very explicit set of users. Right. Where that, where any sort of problems that they have is communicated to me very well versus, um, you know, for me as a user of the language, I may never bring up any issues that I have. Or, and, and it's tough for you, maybe people contributing to the language to be aware of it. So I was curious, just as a general question, how you go about you know, building language meant to serve all kinds of people, many of whom you yeah. may not know exactly what they're doing with it. So yeah, I mean, I, like a yeah. I, I had a general idea when when the when we started the project of like these are the features that I want to have, you know, and, and it was actually pretty small, and I'm pretty sure like I have all of them at this point. Like I wanted algebraic data types, and I wanted a way to uh, write pure functions, uh, you know, and write small data structure libraries, and that you know the initial goals were pretty small. Um, but now people use it for sort of full application development, right? So like the goals have changed a little bit. Um, so it's sort of, you know, it's a fluid thing and it's, it changes over time. Um, but we have some sort of, uh, sort of guiding principles, I guess. Uh, you know, if um, one of the major, like as an example, one of the major uh, features of the language is that the generated JavaScript is readable and compact and, you know, um, any feature which Produces bad JavaScript, which is like hard to read or whatever. Like we'd think, you know, pretty hard about including something like that. Or you know, uh, so we have these sort of general principles. But um, generally, it's just you know we consider each thing as it comes along. It's not like we have a massive set of contributors anyway, right? So yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Of course. Um, okay, so a little bit about the implementation. So the type checker at a very high level can be summarized like this. Okay. Um, a type, what is a type checker? First of all, it, it takes uh, a representation of syntax and it tries to figure out what it means, right? It tries to infer types uh, where type is, you know, an approximation to some sort of meaning. Uh, it goes and, and it takes every subterm of that piece of syntax and it tries to figure out what the type of each subterm is, okay? Um, and then hopefully at the end, the type checker says, I was able to figure out types for all the subterms, your program's good. Or in some cases, it'll say, I figured out some types, but these two types are incompatible. This is a bad program, right? So how does it implement that? So the only two things all done? I mean, at a high level, I suppose. I mean, there's a lot of different types of errors, but uh, essentially it boils down to, are the subtypes of this program compatible with each other? Right? Like one plus hello is a bad program because one is, you know, I expected an int, but I got a string. Um, Okay, uh, so a high level, the first thing we do is we, uh, we go over the, the syntax and we check or infer types and gather constraints, right? So by looking at a small part of the program, we can't figure out um, exactly what the type of that small part of the program is, right? So we, we might not be able to figure it out, but we can gather constraints as we go. And hopefully by the end of it, end of that process, we have enough constraints that get solved uh, to give an answer, right? Um, so we do that, we go over the syntax and we gather constraints. And the second step is that we solve the constraints, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, in the process of solving the constraints, you might learn new information. For example, a functional dependency might fire and say, um, you know, 
I knew these two, this, this, this piece of information and the functional dependency told me this new piece of information. That's a new constraint you can feed back into the constraint solving program, right? So you loop until there's no more constraints that can be solved. And then at the end, you have to do a little bit more work because uh, there's various things you have to check, invariants that didn't get broken, um, and we do this process called generalization, which basically means any unsolved types become type arguments, new type arguments. And any unsolved constraints become constraints on my the type uh, of the inferred thing. Right, so generally, gather constraints, solve constraints in a loop, and clean up is the high level version. Yep. So um, from like this high level overview, uh, this sounds it sounds very much like a Haskell style unification algorithm. Mm -hmm. You know, you generate equality constraints. Yep. But are <coughs> are you talking here about like type class constraints in that sense, or equality constraints in the sense that like a right. unifies with b? So there's, there's two types of constraints. Uh, there's the two you mentioned, right? Type, and they sort of, uh, the solving them is has to be interleaved, right? Because um, functional dependencies take type class constraints and might give us new equality constraints. And if I have equality constraints, that might give me a new piece of information that I can use to solve a type class constraint. So they influence each other. And uh, but yeah, there's, there's two type, types of constraints going on. I'll talk about both briefly. Um, what's time like? Oh. Wow. Okay, Let's speed up a little bit. Okay, so unification. Um, so like I said, you know, local information about a program doesn't give us enough to solve the type for that piece of the program, right? We might need to um, take partial information from different parts of the solving process and glue them together, and that's what unification is about. So unification says, um, if I have these two approximations to a type, can I join them together to give like all of the information combined, right? So, for example, if I have, uh, if I know that these two types are equal, something that I don't know, uh, a function from something that I don't know, so integers, okay? And a function from strings to something else that I don't know. These are different somethings, right? Um, and I know those two things are the same then I know that the answer, this, both of these types have to be equal to string arrow int, right? Um, the only way you can have a function, two functions be equal is if their codomains are equal and their domains are equal, okay? So this one has to be string, this one has to be int, um, and unification is an algorithm that solves that general problem, okay? Um, so the most basic form of stuff we do in the type checker is go and get constraints like this, figure out things like, I'm not exactly sure what the codomain is, uh, sorry, I'm not exactly sure what the domain is, but the codomain is int, or this one, right? And then the solving process takes these and uses unification to solve those constraints. Okay, so unification happens when we learn that two partially known types must be equal. So these are partially known types, and if they're equal, we can figure out the whole type. Um, we might not figure out the whole type in general, right? It might be that this one was also unknown, this might be question mark three, but I still know the general form of the solution is string to something. Right. Um, where is that? Okay. So, really quick example of how you would do type inference, right? Let's say I have a function uh, test. Everyone, I'm sorry. Uh, test of uh, f of x equals f applied to x applied to x again. Right, that's a, that's a pure script program. Um, how would we figure out the types of the expressions, right? So, so the first step was to go through and gather constraints. Maybe I can move this a little bit. Can everybody see that enough? Uh, sorry. All right, so, so let's gather constraints. So we'll start off by giving these things names, right? So I'll call this thing, the type of this thing alpha. F is gonna have type alpha. X is gonna have type beta, right? Um, and let's look at some subterms. Well, so function application parentheses like this, right? F applied to X, applied to X, right? So if I'm applying F to X, then alpha, which is the type of F, must be equal to a function type, okay? Um, and it takes X as an argument, and X has type beta. So its domain must have type beta, okay? 
um, and it must return some other type. But I don't know what the other type is, so I'm just going to make up a type variable. It's called delta. Right? So I have one constraint now. Alpha, which is the type of f, is a function from beta, the type of x, to some other new type delta. Okay? Uh, I didn't use gamma. Let's call it gamma. Okay? So now I know that the type of this thing is gamma. Right? That's the type returned by the function application of f. Okay. And now I can do the same thing. Right? Now I'm applying something of type gamma to the type of x. So that also must be a function. It also must be from beta. Um, and its return type is the return type of the whole function. Right? So let's call that delta. Okay. Um, and test, the type of test is... Uh, well, so delta is going to be the return type of uh, test, right? So uh, test is going to have type alpha to beta to delta. So the first stage might go through and like produce that list of constraints, okay? Uh, the second stage says we need to solve those constraints, and you can solve them just by substitution like you would in like linear algebra or something, right? Um, so go one constraint at a time and just substitute them into all the other equations. So cross that one off the list. Alpha is beta to gamma, so I'm just going to modify this in place. Wait, was that? Yeah, good. Beta to gamma. Test is... No, I got that wrong, didn't I? I think you replaced uh, beta with the... Yes, I did. Thank you. I really shouldn't do this in place. Let's do it properly. Okay. <laughs> Quick check, beta to gamma, beta to delta, alpha to beta to delta, okay. So, so when we solve, we'll get gamma. So the second version of this says, uh, alpha is beta to gamma, so then we only bother substituting th into this one, so we can replace that with test has type beta to gamma to beta to delta, okay? Uh, and then let's cross this one off the list, right? So gamma is beta to delta, so the third version of this is test has type beta to, sorry, beta to delta to beta to delta. And that's correct, right? Now we don't have any type, we don't have any constraints left. That's the most general type of test. Okay. So that's unification, solving, you know, type inference by unification in a nutshell go through, generate all the constraints you can figure out, and then just substitute the constraints into each other until the only thing that's left is the thing you wanted the type of, and then that's your answer. Okay. And anything, so when I said generalization before, in step four, right, the cleanup pass and generalization, um, generalization says anything that was left over that you couldn't figure out the type of is universally quantified beta and delta. Right. So test has type for all beta and delta, beta to beta to delta to beta to delta. Okay. Uh, does that make sense? I'm a bit rushed. A little overview. All right. Uh, nope. Yeah, okay, that's unification. All right, so unification is sort of the heart of the uh, type checking algorithm in pure scripts. Okay. But in order to implement some of the features that I talked about before, type classes, uh, rank n types, sorry, I called it uh, higher rank polymorphism, um, we need to do something a little more interesting, right? So uh, here's the way I think about this thing called bidirectional type checking, okay? If you're going to add features to your language which um, break type inference in the sense that not all programs can be inferred, right? Then, so, you know, if we only had, uh, if we only had, uh, you know, basic uh, functions and applications, simply type lambda calculus, right? Everything has a principal type and everything's great. If we want these features, the price we pay is that, you know, we, we pay a price in terms of inference, right? We can't, like, type reconstruction becomes undecidable when you add certain features, okay? Type reconstruction? So, type reconstruction is the process of going from syntax to types, right? That's an algorithm. Uh, it, it's decidable for simply type lambda calculus and other things, but it's undecidable when you add certain features like rank n types. Okay. The answer is that you need type annotations, right? If you make the trade-off to add these features, you know you're going to lose 
um, type reconstruction. Right. So the only way to solve that problem is to add type annotations to your program to give the compiler help. Okay. If you add type annotations, you have much more information to use. Right? You don't have to go generating constraints. Not everything has to be done by generating constraints and then solving everything at the last minute. If you have uh, type annotations, you can split your type checker into two modes. Right? If you have a type, type annotation, it's easier to check that a term has a type than it is to try and guess what the type was and then check that you guessed the right type. Right? If you don't have a type annotation, you have to fall back on inference. Right? That's, that's mode one. No type annotation, you just do type inference. If you have a type annotation, it's better to check that the type annotation is correct. Okay? Uh, because it'll give you more information to check with. So that's, that's the way I think about this thing called bidirectional checking where, uh, and the gist is that you split your type checker into two functions or two judgments, um, inference and checking. So inference is used when you don't have type annotations, checking is used when you do. In practice, we have a couple more. Um, <clears throat> the function application judgment um, is, is, is used whenever you have a function application. Um, and th that is an application of a function to something else. Is, um, is that tricky? Um, no, it's just it. These things all sort of depend on each other in sort of uh, you know interesting ways, right? Um, the the type inference algorithm is basically like choosing which judgment to use at which po point in the code, right? Um, and they combine in interesting ways. I'm just saying, you know, it's not just inference and checking. You can write. <coughs> You can write a type checker that just uses inference and checking. Um, we need a couple more to, to implement everything we need. Uh, the, the interesting one is called subsumption, which says uh, it's a relationship between two types, and it says basically that one type is more general than another type. Okay. So if um, I might get into a situation where I inferred one type, but you gave me a type annotation anyway, in that case, those types don't have to match exactly, but it better be the case that I thought of something more general than the type you wanted. So that's what subsumption does. Okay. Um, so bidirectional type checking is basically you know these two things, but in practice we have a bunch of different judgments, and they all sort of like depend on each other in in a bunch of interesting ways. Uh, and at the, at the bottom, you know, when you get down to simple types, it basically boils down to unification, and that was this. Right. Um, so that's the algorithm in a, algorithm in a nutshell. Um, and there's a couple of interesting details, right? So there's this thing called scholarization that we need. Um, so when you check something has a polymorphic type, as often comes up when you are working with rank n types and things like that, um, you need a way to represent the. So let me just go back a second. So when I talked about higher rank polymorphism, right, I said the reason this worked was because you had to be polymorphic in the part of the heap you were using, this sort of like conceptual representation of the heap. And here I said this, this is safe, or this, you know, uh, the implementation is hidden because you had to work with any implementation, right? You had to, your function had to work for all implementations. So I need some way in the type system to represent the fact that this implementation type is like some hidden thing, right? Or this heap is some hidden thing that you're not allowed to leak into the surrounding context. So that's where scholarization kicks in, right? That's what that's useful for. So let's say um, I have this type and I have this term. Lambda x goes to x, right? Uh, lambda x goes to 1, right? This has this type. Right. This, this checks against this type. The function that takes x to x certainly takes any a to a. But this, this function, lambda x goes to 1, doesn't have this type. Right? Because it, takes, it certainly takes any type a, but it doesn't return that same type a back. It returns integer. Right? Um, so the way we check this is to use this concept called uh, scholarization. Right? Um, when checking something as a polymorphic type, we need to generate a fresh type variable which does not unify with other types. Right? It can't be made equal to other types. And those are called scholarm constants. Um, and part of the cleanup process is this idea of uh, checking that scholarm constants can't escape. Right? So uh, to give an example, 
we have to check during the escape check that this H didn't leak into the outside context, i.e. you didn't leak any mutable references into the outside context, or this implementation didn't leak out into the result type. Okay, so to check this... So when you check that there is no leakage, mm -hmm. is that the compiler checking its own work or checking the programmer's work? Um, that's the compiler checking the program, the programmer's code, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to illustrate this quickly, if I want to check that uh, lambda x goes to x, checks against type, I'm going to write it this way, for all a, a to a, then the, the, the rule we use says um, we scholomize this polymorphic type, right? So I replace a. I'm going to ask that there exists. Yeah, so I'm going to have to write it a bit bigger, I suppose. Um, OK, if I want to check that lambda x goes to x has type for all a, a, r, o, a. OK? OK, so um, the, the, the rule says uh, I have to replace this for all, uh, get rid of the for all, and replace the a inside with this column constant. OK, so that's true, writing it in a sort of natural deduction style. Uh, if for some fresh column constant, which I'll write over here, so generate a scholum, and I'll call it I don't know, star or something. Um, lambda x goes to hex checks against type star to star for some fresh scholum constant star. Okay. Um, in order to do that, we can check that. Well, I guess we need a context, so we can check that. Uh, the result has type. And what's that symbol you got on the left? This, uh, I need to sort of keep track of the variables that are in scope, and this is the way we write it in uh, when we do. If you read type checking papers, you'll find it's often written in the sort of mean? natural deduction style. Uh, this, is, this represents a context, so it's a, a collection of type variables that are in scope. Uh, this turnstile means uh, entails or something along those lines. So, uh, or in the context gamma, you can. You, it can be proven that such and such has type such and such if the thing above the line. Okay, so if I can check that x in the context gamma, oops, sorry, in the context gamma augmented with the assumption, right, this is the, the checking rule for functions. Um, and then, you Wait, know, I just use. This, I don't know Sorry, I, I, I should probably just skip this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, no, don't skip, don't skip. Okay. Okay, so, so <laughs> this is like a compact notation for the algorithm that the uh, type checker implements, right? Every step from below a line to above the line represents forward progress in the type checker, right? Um, there's a lot of rules in the type checker that say things like, if you want to check that something has a polymorphic type, scholomize the type and check the scholomized type instead. Okay, that's an actual pattern match that exists in the compiler somewhere. Um, and then there's another one that says, if you want to check that uh, this is called something like check a function or something, right? If you want to check that a function has a function type, then check that the result type has the result type in the context augmented where the, the name that you bound on the left-hand side of the function has this type. Right, so I, I move this assumption into the context, and then I check that the result has the right type. Okay? And then finally, there's the variable rule that says, if you have something in the context, you can just use it to prove what you want to prove. Right? So, of course I can prove x has type star in the context that tells me that x has type star. So I'm done. Good, right? Uh, that's, that's using scholarization to check, you know, this. But if, now if I go through and I replace, you know, my other example was a bad example, right? This, has, this obviously is not going to work, right? So we just plumb everything through. Now I said the result has to have type star. Okay. So I can try and use this rule. Uh, sorry, I don't even have to try and use that rule. Right? I can just say, you know, if I have some rule for integers or something, one obviously has type int. And I can check that, you know, I said scholum constants don't unify with anything else. It can't be made equal to int. So that's the type error. 
Uh, so SCOLUM and constants have two properties. They can't unify with anything except for unification variables, which have to unify with everything, right? So they, they unify with the absolute minimum set of things they could possibly unify with. And um, they're not allowed to leak out of scope. So we have, this con we have this concept of scope that I talked about earlier where, you know, my syntax, every piece of my syntax, you know, is associated with a certain piece of scope and a for all introduces a new scope and part of the cleanup operation that I have to do at the end of type checking checks that this H didn't leak out of that scope. Um, do you have an example of a type mm -hmm. where the type checker might, have com might complain about something escaping its scope? Uh, it's tricky to come up with one. Um, I wish I'd prepared one. Uh, so the usual example is something like run ST applied to something where you leak a type variable. Right, so if, actually I can give you an example. Um, so you can write this in Haskell, right? Run ST, new ST ref one has an escape type variable. Right, uh, escape column, sorry. Because right, I, I created a new ST ref and I tried to have it leave its scope. The scope is this part of the program, right? Um, so I have to check. So when I'm checking this, I get into checking mode here, right? Because I applied a function to this thing. So I check that this has type for all h s t h a. Okay. Um, so I check. I'm checking something against a polymorphic type. I have to scholarize it, right? So I say check that it has type st star a, where star is a new scholar constant. Okay, well, new st ref, st ref has type, what does it have? It has type a to sth st ref h a. Okay, so I have to check that. Uh, uh, yes, I am. Thank you. For all H A. Um, now the type you wrote mm -hmm. below is the type you know this has because it's an argument of run ST. Yes. Okay. So um, let me get this the right way around. Uh, this has to. One of these has to be more general than the other. Sorry, I wish I'd have prepared something for this. Um, anyway, the point is this type A ends up becoming st ref h a okay and then when the escape checker like looks at the type of this thing it says that's st rate st ref h a but this is the scope of h h appeared outside its scope so it got a scope leak so to be clear because i'm sure my implementation of escape check is totally broken right now so uh, i want to ask this question well, I have you in the room, mm -hmm. which is basically so the the scope the scope that you talk about, like that syntactic, is mm -hmm. that based on the, syn the 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 syntactic type or the syntactic expression? Like, is it is it limited based on where the for alls are? It's where the for alls are. Okay. Yeah, um, and I never particularly liked like uh, the implementation I have of scholarization, especially the escape check. It's kind of really messy. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to do it this way. Like another way to do it is when you, every time a unification happens between a unification variable and a scholar constant, you just sort of like write it into a log, right? And then your scopes become ranges. Uh, so in addition, what you do is every time you check something as to polymorphic type, you, you remember which unification variables you saw during that period. Um, and that's a range, right? And then you look at your log at the end and you say, do any of these, did any of these unifications fall outside that range? And that, right. that yeah. gist you linked to me a while back. Yeah, it does it that way. That. Um, and then the other way you can do it is to not use scholarization at all, which is what uh, the complete and easy rank and types paper does, where the, um, the context actually tracks, you know, um, scope implicitly. Okay. Pressing on, pressing on. All right, um, type classes. Right, so very quick uh, version of what we do for checking type classes. Um, we can think of type classes as elaborating to dictionary passing style. Right, that can that that can be our semantics for the type checker. Okay, um, every time we see something where we we have to apply a polymorphic function that has a type class constraint, we can 
um, just insert a placeholder for a dictionary that we need to figure out later. Okay, so if I have a quick example, class show a, so this is, you know, this is the same as in Haskell essentially. Uh, well, not exactly the same, but I have this class called show a, and it has a function that lets me turn an a into a string. Okay, so we have that same function in Haskell. Um, so let's say, say I write a function called shout, uh, and it takes an argument x, and it's implemented as show x plus plus some exclamation points or something, right? Um, okay, so let's, uh, so when we, when we check this function, when we type check this function, right, we, let's say we get to here, okay, uh, and we look at the type of show and it says, that like, you know, this is, this is a class constrained function, right? So the actual type of show is show has type for all A, show A implies that we have a function from A to string. Okay, and there's another type checker rule that says if you have, if you try to apply a function that's um, constrained, then just insert a dictionary that's going to be a placeholder for like, uh, the dictionary passing style we're going to elaborate to. So this elaborates to shout x equals show applied to dictionary applied to x plus plus some explanation points. Okay. So after type checking so type checking is not just a predicate, right? Like it doesn't just tell us this is okay or this is bad. It actually is a transformation on source programs from the source code you gave me to the thing that has type class dictionaries all the way through it, right? Um, so some of the type judgments tell you how to insert type dictionary. Right? So we replace it with this. This has been elaborated. Where yeah. does uh, the dict come from? Is, is it, should that be a parameter on shout? Should it be shout x dict or dict? So we can think of it as like a regular type. Like it, in the generated code, it really is like a function application. Mm -hmm. Like it's just another. Um, now we're applying function. You know, show to two arguments instead of just one. Um, but th there's type information in here, right? So uh, like this is going to end up with the type like you know for all a. It's going to have this type. Right, um, and it's going to be this a that we need a dictionary for show for in here, right? So, in in reality, you know, there's this type information hidden inside this placeholder, right? Um, and then during the solving phase, another thing we do during the solving phase is to solve these placeholders for actual dictionaries. We go through all of the instances that could possibly replace that dictionary and pick the one that makes sense based on the types that we have. Okay. Um, is there anything? No. Any questions on that? If you have multiple choices, mm -hmm. do you throw your hands up yeah. in the air? Um, so right now, uh, I, have, I have a slide about what we want to do with overlapping instances. Um, but right now, we just give a warning and say, this is the one we picked. Um, which, you know, it's not ideal, but we don't tend to have that many overlaps. Um, functional dependencies, implementation, um, it's basically just a slight modification to the instance solver that replaces these dictionaries. Okay, so um, I said that functional dependencies imply, you know, the solver the solver uh, loops until there's no more constraints to be solved. Right. Um, on each stage, we solve at least one constraint, and new type information becomes available. Right. So every time we solve a constraint and we get new type information, we go through and we update these little placeholder types inside our you know dictionary placeholders, and then hopefully on the next turn, this one will have its turn to get replaced with an actual dictionary. Right. Until the solver stops and everything's been solved, or we find something we can't solve. Um, that's that's sort of the the gist of the functional dependencies implementation. Um, I was going to go through an example, but it's not particularly interesting. Um, okay, so I already talked about the cleanup step a little bit, the uh, scholem escape check I already mentioned, uh, and then generalization as well. So, you know, introducing the for alls that we need uh, for any type variables we couldn't solve, and then if there's any constraints we couldn't solve and we didn't have a type signature, we can add the unsolved constraints as constraints on our inferred type. 
Any questions on that? Nope. All right. Uh, just quickly talk about a few novel features we have. Uh, I've been talking for an hour, so try and get through this reasonably quickly. Okay. The biggest thing that we have that Haskell doesn't have, or at least right now, it might get it at some point in some future version, I suppose, um, is row polymorphism. Okay. So uh, row polymorphism. The easiest, easiest way to see the value of raw polymorphism is to just show a quick example. Um, so JavaScript has objects, right? And objects have multiple properties. They are mappings from the labels that object has to the types of the values in those, in those labels, okay? Um, one way to talk about objects is to use subtyping. And we don't do subtyping because it's type inference properties are a little tricky and uh, the other reason is because we have raw polymorphism and uh, there's a lot of neat things you can do with raw polymorphism. Um, so suppose we want to write, this is, this is a valid pure script program here, right? So a getter for the foo property on a record. So getter of a record is rec.foo, right? So it's just like JavaScript. So you can just say, you know, object.property. Um, what type does this have, right? So it certainly takes an object as its, uh, <clears throat> oh, I should say this, this is the inferred type, right? You don't have to add this type annotation. One nice thing about row, row polymorphism as opposed to subtyping is that uh, type reconstruction is possible, okay? Um, so it certainly takes an object as its input and it returns some type A and the object that it takes in has a foo label with A in that label, okay? But there's nothing to stop us passing in an object with more than just a foo property, right? I can say getter takes a record with a foo property and any other properties um, and gives me an A, okay? And the quantification over this R thing here, right, um, is quantification over a row of types. So a row is a mapping from labels to types, okay? So the ability to quantify over these rows, like these tails of object properties I don't particularly care about right now, is called raw polymorphism, okay? Um, and just like we can do get, getting properties, we can also do updating or setting properties, right? So if I give you an A and a foo, that, uh, you know, a label, uh, an object that has a foo label with an A in that label and any other properties, then I can give you back something of the same type, right? But crucially, the, the tail is the same type, right? The, the type of the tail didn't change. By updating foo, I didn't update bar or remove bar or add baz or anything, okay? Um, so this is quite, quite handy and it's a really nice fit for JavaScript records. Question? Yeah. Couldn't you actually uh, generalize setter a little bit more to have uh, uh, the second argument? Oh, actually, yes. So that could be a B and that could be a B, right? Yeah, yeah you could. Uh, I think the inferred type actually is that. Uh, maybe I'll do that at the end. Um, okay, so like I say, it's a really nice fit for objects, right? We can talk about the labels and types that an object has, uh, but it also is a fit for a lot of other things. So here's one thing we've had in PureScript uh, since pretty much the beginning, since we added raw polymorphism, um, which is extensible effects. Right, so instead of talking about mappings from labels to types, I'm gonna talk about mappings from labels to effects, where effects are just uh, type level tokens that can track uh, you know, the, the side effects I have in my program. Right, so if I have this function get from network, which like goes, and goes out and gets some resource from some network device, right? Um, I can say that's an effectful thing, right? It returns some X. But it's effectful, so I'm going to use this f monad to track the effectfulness, and I'm going to track it with this row of effects. Right? So I'll say get from network can operate in any effectual, effectful context that supports network operations. But I'm also going to let you be. I'm also going to let you uh, use it in contexts that support other effects. Okay. Just because you're doing network effects shouldn't preclude you from doing non-network effects. Okay, and then when I use this in main, for example, I can use this alongside, let's say, log show, which prints out that network result. Okay, and that gives me a console effect. So, console, so log show gives me a console effect, and get network resource gives me a network effect, and unification joins the rows together. Okay, so because we have nice inference properties for rows, it means we have, 
you know, inference for the effects that our main program has. So you can think of F as being a little bit like Haskell's I.O., except for that we're tracking this, you know, exactly the set, set of, you know, things you're actually doing in main. Not exactly, but, you know, an approximation to the things you're doing in main. And I can cut this off, right? So this one is polymorphic. I said, you're also allowed to run this computation in context that support other effects. But I don't want that for main, right? I don't want to say, oh, and main can have any other effects. I want to say, no, main has exactly the set of effects, right? I don't want to know that launch the missiles happen to be an effect in main, right? Um, what if you wanted to say it writes to the console and it reads from the network? Can you do that? Yeah, so you can. You, you have to sort of refine your effects into you know, smaller set, you know, um, sets of behaviors. So you'd have different effects. You'd have like a write effect and a read effect. And we do that in some libraries like the React bindings. Um, it's important in React that you don't update state in certain lifecycle methods, for example, or props or something. Um, so, so we use this to make sure you can't do that. Um, it does, there is a bit of a drawback though. Um, there's this sort of like open world assumption with effects, right? Um, anybody can come and define a new effect anytime. There isn't like a closed world of effects. So you have this sort of problem where how do you define, how do you decide on like what the set of effects should be? Uh, and how does it mix with the sort of open world assumption? It's generally a bit, that, that's, the, that's the major downside as I see it, this. But there's other approaches um, to extensible effects that you can do in pure scripts with raw polymorphism that do it properly. So like pure script. Sorry, go ahead. The, the open world problem, is, does yeah. that mean you could write a function that says this only writes to the console and has other effects? Right. Someone makes another effect, or another, I don't know what you call it, so, so the problem and reading to the console? So the problem is right, like I I write my libraries and I use the console effect. But then you might come along and say, but I want to separate into read and write. So I'm gonna make my own effect. But now if a you know if a caller uses both of our libraries, they need to know about both of our types of effects when really we're both talking about the same console thing, right? So that's the problem with the open world you know, nature of effects is that you have to have this sort of like global, you have to like coordinate amongst all developers to make sure you only use the set of effects, right? Which is obviously not very practical. Um, but in practice, it tends to work quite nicely. So. I have, I have several yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, the console has type console, network has type network. Yep. Pass to F. What, what is that structure? Yep. So this is, um, th no, uh, so. Notice here you have curly braces, right? This is syntactic sugar. It elaborates to a type constructor called record applied to a row, okay? And this is a row, right? So I could have written what I had before by saying record and then the exact same thing, but in parentheses, not in curly braces. Um, so this is a row of effects, right? There's a, there's a kind called effects and console and network have kind effect. And then this thing is a row of effects. And F is a type constructor that takes a row of effects and a return type and gives me a, and gives me a type. And an effect is? It's just a token. It, it's no, there's no like runtime representation. Yeah, it's, it's like a singleton. Type classes. It feels yeah. like saying, as long as you have eek, I can do this. You're saying it's a little bit like... Um, console here, I can do log show. It's a little like, so it has some similarities with like MTL, right? Where you have like monad state, monad... Uh, error, whatever, and um, uni sorry, uh, constraints bubble up to the top, right? But uh, so it's it's different in two ways. We're using rows, obviously, and we're using unification on rows to do something similar. But also, this is just a phantom type, right? There's no there's no runtime representation of this. There's no dictionary passing going on um, for MTL classes or anything like that. And the reason is it all gets, you know, eventually at the end of the day, all we're doing is running. We're just trying to run JavaScript functions, right? And JavaScript functions have, you know, any effects, right? Any effects supported by the JavaScript runtime. And we're just trying to partition those up. It's just a phantom type that sort of partitions it up and says, I'm only using this subset. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how do you implement row polymorphism? Um, well, I already said rows are maps from labels to types. And actually in the compiler, we implement them as association lists. They are uh, kept in sorted order. Right, so if you want to unify two, um, you can basically, if you want to unify two rows, you can basically just do uh, like a, a mer the merge portion of a merge join, right? Uh, you keep them in sorted order and then you go through um, element by element, 
uh, you know, uh, both of the rows. And if you see two labels that are the same, then you unify the types that are associated with those labels. If you see one that's in one side, but not in the other, then you push that label into the tail of the other one. Um, and hopefully that tail, you know, was a type variable or something, right? So that, so for example, if I have this console here and I, I have to, I have to unify the type of get network resource with this, some, some type that involves this row. Right, which involves console. So console doesn't appear in this row, but it's polymorphic in the tail, so I can always just push the console constraint into the, into the tail. Right? Um, so question, yeah. um, the tail, you could, you could, have, you could replace, um, instead of running like network, network, console, console, you could say network, network, pipe, parenthesis, console, console, yes. and parenthesis. Exactly, okay. yeah. Um, what did I say here? Unification of rows must ignore order of different labels. All right, so I'll actually, it's sort of a technicality, but the, lab the rows that we have are like for duplicates. So um, we keep things in sorted order inside the compiler for a row, but when we have duplicate labels, we have to make sure that we don't reorder the duplicates because the order is important for duplicates for the same label. Um, for example, if I have effects and I want to track the fact that I can throw two exception types, it's important to remember the order in which I'm going to catch them. Right. Um, so and the, yeah, the, yeah. The duplicate labels, do they have to have the same values? Uh, they have to, they, well, they'd have the same label. They can have different types inside. They have yeah. Types. yeah. So in the getter and setter example, is there a, there's a quite ordering here? Yeah. All right, let's go back. So, so here, you're saying that I could have a foo inside R, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, you, you absolutely can, right? So then you have to answer the question, what is the meaning of a record, right? Given a row of types, I have some meaning that maps rows of types to subsets of values that exist inside the JavaScript runtime, right? Um, and the meaning that we give to records is only considers the first, uh, the first occurrence of a, of a label, which means that uh, you, can't, you can't type, is it deletion? One of the things that you might want to do with records, you can't give a nice type to, unless you have like some sort of constraints on your, yeah, your rows. Yeah, but addition. Is it addition? Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, like pure addition, not like updating. Yeah. Takes, you only have one label or one value, a specific label. If you want to add one, you have to first check that it doesn't already exist in the record. Because if you just, in this program, extend it, then it would think it's still had two labels, but you only have one. Yeah, that sounds right. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, cool feature number two is row constraints. Um, so we have a few different types of row constraints. The first one is uh, union. Uh, it basically, I'll just sort of run through this real quick. But union says it's a, it's a three-way relation between three rows. And it basically says that the third one is the union of the first two. So why is that handy? Well, it lets me type things like joining two, joining two records together and just keeping all the keys, right? And there's an implementation of this in this PureScript records library. And uh, I wanted this feature ever since I saw it in the Ermine compiler. Um, so we sort of nabbed the idea a little bit from there. I don't believe they have duplicate labels, so it's a little bit different, but the, the idea is essentially the same. What's that? Ermine, um, it's, uh, it's the, yeah, it's uh, SMP, Capital IQ, I think, right, develops it, uh, compiles to the JVM, I believe. Um, and they have row polymorphism as well, and they have these, these nice row constraints. Um, so it, it lets you give nice types to like joins, like relational joins and, and things like this. Um, ours is a little different from the one in Ermine, but the concept is basically the same. So this is, this is sort of illustrative of like a general thing that we're tending towards in PureScript, right? So we have two features. Uh, row polymorphism and um, functional dependencies. And we're using functional dependencies in a really crucial way here, right? To like infer things from, infer types from other types. This is, we can think of this as a, two, uh, a type function on two rows that gives me back another row. Well, I can't write type class instances for rows because they'd all be orphans anyway, right? But what I can do is just define this, com d define this class in the compiler and then have the compiler solve it automatically. And we do that for a handful of instances, right? So it's just this magic type class that like, essentially lives inside the, you know, is baked into the compiler. Um, 
Can you explain how to read? Like, what's the comma mean there? In the, in the pipe? Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, so pipe is all the functional dependencies occur to the right of the pipe. The functional dependencies are separated with commas. And every functional dependency is, you know, says these inputs give these outputs. Right, so if you know R1 and R2, you know R3. In addition, if you know R1 and R3, you know R2. Okay. Um, so is that a yeah. disjoint union then? Um, it is, no, you can have duplicates, right? So when you union, you might produce a row that has duplicates. But if you know R1 and you know the result of the union, did I get it the wrong way around? Do you also know the thing that you unioned with? I think we actually have all three. If you know any two, you know the third. Um, I forget the details, it, th th that might be wrong, but I, I, th I think we actually have all three. Um, in the way the compiler implements it, I think it, you do actually have the property that if you know two, you know the third. So. I, I don't know how you could implement, or I, I don't know how you could solve the uh, R1 and R3 gives you R2, unless it were like a disjoint mm -hmm. union, because then you know, there could be uh, like several different... Well, it's, it's dis the inputs don't have to be disjoint, right? But they, uh, we have, it's unions taking duplicates into account, right? So if I union foo has type A with foo has type B, then you get a row with foo twice, A then B. Okay. Right, so it really is just sort of subtraction, like just, you know, it, okay. it, it doesn't mean that I have to have a solution, right? Like it says, if if you have a solution, it has to be the only one. Okay. Yeah. Um. So uh, <coughs> R1 Sorry. could be foo has type A, R2 could be foo has type A and bar has type B. Yes. And R3 would be then the same as R2. No, it'd be no? foo, foo, bar. So there are two foo A's there? Yes, exactly. So it's really crucial that when you define the meaning of a record, you make sure you pick, you know, the, if you have duplicates, you pick the type that's consistent with this, right? Because when I union, I want to make sure, you know, I, I pick the right one and I might have duplicates. Um, anyway, I just wanted to quickly say, like, there's this, there's this idea that we can use functional dependencies and row polymorphism together um, to add these sort of magic type classes into the compiler, right? We can't write instances for rows, but we can write, um, we can automatically solve like a small set of um, constraints on rows inside the compiler. And that gives us like a small language for doing things that you might want to do on rows, like maps, zips, unions, intersections. Uh, and that's, that's something that's sort of in you know, in the works at the moment. Um, so it gives us this nice sort of like type language for working with rows. So the order of a row matters? Uh, the order of the different labels, different labels with respect to each other can be reordered. Duplicates of the same label cannot be reordered. What, when you reorder, are you just talking about you're looking for something? Why would you reorder just for organization? Yeah. Um, if, if you unify two things, you can think about it as like I have to reorder one of them to get them in the right shape to unify them. If you think about them as lists, um, as a data structure, you can think of it as a map from labels to ordered lists of types. If that helps. I hadn't thought about like if you had a name in each one when there were different types, like one was a string and one was whatever a name is. Then hmm. Have two names in the merged, loop, in the merged uh, row, but they're different types. Uh, they can have different types. Yeah, yeah. we we actually use that in. Um, so with the extensible effect, it, it can be handy in a couple of places. I mean, the duplicate rows, duplicate labels doesn't show up all that much, but I think having duplicates was probably the right choice. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, we didn't used to have duplicates, and we used to actually have a check that at the end part of the cleanup pass was to make sure nothing got unified that generated duplicate labels. Um, but now we, now we allow them. Okay, uh, cool thing number three real quick. Um, polymorphic labels, right? So as a quick demo of like the unreasonable effectiveness of fundeps plus row polymorphism, um, another thing we can bake into the compiler is this row cons thing, right? Which t if we could think of you know a row as like a list, uh, an association list, right? Then I should be able to con something onto the front of it. So if you give me a type level symbol L representing a label and a type that's going to go in that label and a row, then I'll give you a new row where I've cons L comma A onto the front of it. 
Right? So if you know L and A in the row, then you know the output, so it's functional in the direction you want. But you can also extract the type if you know the label. Right? So that means I can write um, row po like po polymorphic lenses, for example, for records. Right? If you give me a value level proxy for a type level string, then I can give you a lens that lenses into that property inside your generic record. And does everyone know what association this is? Oh, um, That's what you're talking just, about. Yeah, just, uh, well, I suppose I should just say you can, this class adds on a new label and type to a, to a type level row. Yeah, sorry. Given that ordering for the strength of duplicate labels, do you actually need R1 in the second function there? In the second one, R1. Um, so that says if I know the label and I know the row and I know the output after I const it on. Right. I think you only need to know the output because you've got the ordering of duplicate labels. That's correct. Yes. In fact, I could move R1 onto the right-hand side there, I think. It's almost certainly true that yeah. the compiler's right and I wrote it down wrong here. Um, yeah. So... This is, this is really powerful, right? This, this lets me write one lens for every record property. You know, any, any record property I could think of. Um, you give me this symbol, this type level string that I'm gonna turn into a label. Uh, and I'll, you have to pass me like a string, a symbol proxy for it, like to, to, to let me know the type. But then I can give you a lens for, that lenses into a record um, that gives me a type the type that I wanted. And the thing that makes this type safe, right, is the fact that A, A has to be related to R2 by this row cons thing. It says that A appears at label L inside R2 because I conned it on. So it gives us this uh, polymorphic label concept. Um, and this is kind of a novel, I think it's kind of a novel approach to polymorphic labels. It just sort of fell out of the functional dependencies and row polymorphism stuff, which was really nice. Um, another example of this is you know, if you want, so we can think of records as um, <clears throat> records as like you know uh, anonymous products of different types with labels, right? Well, what if we wanted anonymous sums of different types, right? Data constructors in PureScript and Haskell are nominally typed, right? They're not anonymous. They have you know a data type declaration introduces a new name, but we have this thing called variants, polymorphic variants that appears in um, languages like OCaml, um, and we can just emulate those, we can just build those as a library in PureScript using exactly the same, exactly the same stuff, right? So um, instead of lenses, if I just turn this, you know, if I change this into a prism, this is now a function that can be impl implemented, right? If you want a prism that looks at a certain constructor, and you can give me a, a value level proxy for a type level string that's the name of that constructor, then I can build you that prism. Right? And this is implemented in uh, Nathan's um, pure script variants library. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff you can do with uh, with this this functional dependencies row polymorphism combination. I think it's really powerful, which is why you know functional dependencies is like one of my favorite uh, feature additions we added. Um, and then one other thing that I think is really cool that we have that Haskell didn't have until recently, but they just added it in eight two two or whatever the very latest thing was. Um, is this feature that we tacked onto type holes. So uh, if you're familiar with type holes in Haskell, right? If, you, if you're halfway through writing a program and you can't remember what bit goes in, you know, where you are, you can just put a type hole and say, please figure this out for me. And Haskell will say, the type of the type hole is this thing, right? It'll, it'll gather all the constraints from the type checker that are relevant to the type hole. Um, and it'll figure out what the type of the type hole is and tell you. And then you can use this for type-directed programming, right? So now you can just narrow down and sort of iteratively write your program piece by piece, refining type holes into smaller type holes. But what PureScript will do, which is really nice, I think, is that we'll also go through and use the, sub, uh, the subsumption judgment from the type checker to check all of the things that are in context for programs that are valid substitutions for the type hole. So if you do this in PureScript and you say, okay, I want this flatten function that takes a list of maybes and gives me a maybe of lists and just say, I forgot what the function is. It will say, it's sequence, right? It's, it's, its type is more general than you want, the one you thought of, but it's okay because the subsumption relation told us that it's, um, you know, it's a valid substitution for the type tool, okay? Um, so it's like an, a nice little uh, addition to the type checker, I think, that like, really helps 
I use this all the time. It's one of my favorite features in PureScript. Really helps a lot with type-driven development. Um, and the implementation is really straightforward to describe. You just basically go all the way through all the terms in the context. You use the subsumption judgment to um, just check every type against the thing you had in the environment. And if it's a match, if the subsumption judgment doesn't throw an error, then it's a match and you report it. And then at the end, you just repeat the cleanup process just to make sure that in the process of testing this thing, you didn't have like a skull and escape or something. Um, and Christoph, who is one of the core contributors to Peer Scripts, wrote about this in his thesis. And if you can get him to give you a copy of his thesis, then you can read about it there. Um, is it not possible yeah. that there's an infinite number of types that would have to try? Um, no, because I only have so many things in context, right? I, I only try named functions that uh, you have in libraries you've imported. So there's a finite number of those, unless you have like some, you know, you can't have an infinite amount of code, right? So we just try each one of those. Um, and we just run subsumption against so each one. So one that you wouldn't try like f of x and y. So crucially, what we don't do is we don't try and find every generalization of a type and test it for equality, right? That's what the subsumption judgment does. It says, is this type more general than this other one? But I don't have to sort of, I don't have to sort of guess what the more, you know, does that make sense? Sorry. Kind of. Yeah, so if I say, uh, I want something of type int to int, the compiler can say the identity function has type for all a, a to a, which is not the type you asked for, but it's more general, so it's okay. And the subsumption judgment is the function that tells me uh, for all a, a to a is more general than int to int. <clears throat> but I don't, have to, I don't have to guess for all a, a to a or something, if that, you know. In which case, yeah, you might run into that problem. I did a good talk on that in the video, all the mm. things he wrote that can work in Adam and Vim and Emacs and uh, all kinds of stuff. Oh, Christoph did? Yeah. And, uh, I think I missed that one. Mm. So you can do all kinds of things, like put your cursor on a thing and hit that, it changes mm. the whole, and it's almost looking like the dress. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. He had, uh, he had a nice example um, where he had, it was sort of like very real world where um, you have different entities in a database and keys for each of those entities and you have like a polymorphic fetch function, for example, that gives a key and gives me the entity type of that key. Um, and then a, a handful of sort of helper functions to go with that and then, um, you know, you just have type holes, like try and write a program that I like fetch this loop over this list, fetch each one of those, and then, you know, it would always infer the right, even though everything was way more polymorphic than you needed, it would always, always infer the, exactly the right fetch function, which I thought was really cool. Um, okay, super quickly. Uh, future work, I would really like to have instance chains. It's been on the to-do list for a long time. Um, so the problem, uh, you asked about overlapping before, right? Um, the problem is sometimes you want to write type functions like this. If I want to determine uh, whether two types are equal or not, uh, did I write this wrong? This is wrong, I'm sorry. Um, so this should say, have some result, where the result is a type level Boolean, right? So those things are equal and these things are not equal. Um, the problem is that Wait, these are all the first read through what this right. says. I want, I want a function that given two types tells me if they're equal or not. Right. Uh, so it's a function from two types to a type level Boolean R, true or false. Okay. Um, if you give me A and A for any A, then they're equal, so it's true. If you give me A and B, they're not equal, so it's false. The problem is I have to try this instance before I try this instance, because this instance applies to everything. They're overlapping, okay? Um, and they're overlapping. You might say, oh, true and false are not, they don't unify, but the problem is there's a functional dependency, right? So I only have to know A and B in order to choose that instance. Um, so what instance chains do is uh, let you put an ordering on, <clears throat> they let you make a chain out of your instances and say, try this one, then try this one, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a lot of different ways, and actually there was a really nice post uh, yesterday, I think, on Reddit Haskell. Uh, a proposal for uh, a partner's constraints, where, which is sort of an alternative to this. And there's a whole bunch of different uh, alternatives, but you know, 
uh, we try and decide what the best one is and we'll go and implement something like this. And I think this will be one of the last pieces in like the type level programming. Is this like lifting pattern matching to the type level? Yeah, you can think of it that way. So um, with like the type level prologue stuff, you know, you have these goals, but they can overlap, right? This, this is a way of like making it really like pattern matching. So like try this, then this one. That, would eliminate the need for like closed type families entirely and just um, eliminate the need for type families? So, I don't know if there's cases where you need type families that functional dependencies wouldn't do the job. Certainly, the way I use functional dependencies and type families, I haven't run into any. Um, I don't have any plans to implement type families closed or open because it's it would require some really serious changes to the type checker, I think, and functional dependencies is like, like I say, a lot of benefit for such a little implementation right now. Um, so yeah, in, uh, in, in theory, I'm not sure, in practice, yeah. Um, and then the other one is constraint kinds, right? So um, just like we said with uh, higher kinded types that we could um, abstract over type constructors, well, constraint kinds lets me abstract all the constraint constructors, right? So if I want to write a map function on rows, but where I'm allowed to, you know, so this, this says, you know, you give me a function, uh, you give me a, sorry, I give you an input row and an output row and a function that maps types to types, right, via a constraint, um, then I can sort of map that function over the rows, right? If I want to implement this, then I need, um, <clears throat> or if I want to implement it Generically, I need constraint kinds, right? Because I need to be able to say, um, I need to be able to parameterize all this, the constraint constructor that represents my function, okay? Um, so these are the two last pieces in like the, the puzzle for like type level functional, type level programming with rows that I'd really like to have in PureScript. Um, oh, I have some references if people are interested. My favorite paper for like Haskell 98 inference is Typing Haskell in Haskell by Mark Jones, which is sort of like very easy read, like functional Perl type of paper, very much recommend it. If you're interested in higher rank polymorphism, um, there's a paper called Complete and Easy Bidirectional Type Checking for Higher Rank Polymorphism, uh, which is excellent. I took a lot of uh, cues from that. And the HMF paper is also great, but it's not, uh, not quite as close to what I talked about, although it does talk about scholarization. Um, type classes and fund apps. Uh, the original type class papers are great. How to make ad hoc polymorphism less ad hoc by Phil Wadler is a great paper. And the original functional dependencies papers by Mark Jones are also great. Uh, and Mark Jones also co-authored the instance chains paper, which has a nice summary of some of the fund apps um, material as well. Uh, if you're interested in extensible records, Brian McKenna has a fantastic blog post from a few years ago called Raw Polymorphism Isn't Subtyping. Uh, and he also implemented the uh, Roy compiler, which is where I originally saw Raw Polymorphism uh, and wanted to implement it. Uh, and then uh, Dan Lehan, I think is how you pronounce his name? Uh, not sure, but from Microsoft Research has a bunch of uh, interesting papers on uh, extensible records with other interesting things like scope labels, extensible, uh, sorry, first class labels. Um, and he also wrote uh, the COCA pro programming language, which also has uh, row polymorphic effect types, just like PureScript, uh, but with different elaboration. Uh, and the Airmind compiler is also a great resource for row polymorphism. So that's it. Yeah, questions? Is the reason uh, uh, PureScript is strict uh, uh, purely an artifact of J uh, JavaScript being strict, or were there other considerations like simplicity? Um, so I came from TypeScript, and I wanted to have the same property that I had with TypeScript, where I just I could completely predict what the, com the compiled output would be like, so that when I went to debug it, I would just know, like, be able to read it immediately. Um, it's obviously much more difficult to do that in a lazy language because, well, you know, you need a runtime to implement laziness um, and everything has to go through the runtime, right? Um, so that was the original reason for strictness and obviously it comes with a lot of trade-offs. I use Haskell every day and I love laziness as a general, you know, as a default, but uh, it's a really interesting challenge to sort of <coughs> implement some of the things you would do in Haskell in PureScript and you always have to have strictness in the back of your mind, you know? Are there any transpiler attempts that uh, <coughs> uh, go from lazy to JavaScript? 
There is a Haskell backend um, for PureScript. So one thing PureScript has is the ability to switch out the backend. We can uh, stop the compiler after generating the intermediate representation, which we call functional core, and you can output it to JSON. And people have written backends for like Python and uh, C++, 11, um, Erlang, and um, you so one backend actually targets Haskell, which is an interesting choice because obviously Haskell's lazy, and it uses a Haskell library to implement raw polymorphism. Um, so there's sort of an interesting question, it's like if you take a language which is designed for strictness and all this, you know, uh, standard libraries are strict, you know, implemented with strictness in mind, to what extent can you just compile that to a lazy language and like sort of hope for the best, right? I, I don't know the answer, um, but it's possible. Any other questions? Um, from a from an anecdotal level, mm. how much does the pure script community miss laziness if at all? Um, so there are some really interesting challenges that come with choosing strictness as the default. Um, so one library that I wrote recently was like a little FRP library, and it took me the longest time to figure out how to do FRP in a strict language. Um, you can't rely on sort of, you know, Haskell, with Haskell you have this sort of wealth of knowledge that's, you know, built up, but a lot of it depends on using, you know, laziness, like crucially, right? And so you can't just take it and just naively translate it. Um, yeah, even simple things like monad transformers, right, or like free monads or things like this are not, you can't, you can't just translate them over. So it's, it sort of presents some interesting challenges, but, um, you know, it has, it has its own benefits as well, so, yeah. Strict folder is the worst. A strict folder, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, are you, yeah. Are you it's kind of like how in Haskell you want a, a strict folder, a lazy folder, and right. it's kind of like the sweet spot. In, in JavaScript you have a strict folder, which just makes folder kind of useful. Yeah, if, if you want lazy lists, um, with like lazy folds and you know lazy write folds and a library of lazy write folds built up, there is a library that provides that. But you know it, it took a little while to get it right because we couldn't just port it naively from Haskell. But um, you can build. So the answer is you can build all these things using laziness as a library. It just takes some sort of cunning and uh, a bit of you know you know it's just difficult in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. Are you gonna have the Casper theory group at all? Category theory group. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to mention that later. Actually, if I'd love to get that started. Yeah, um, should have brought that up in the announcements. Actually, yeah. So yeah. there's some talk about having a category theory study group if anybody's interested. I'm interested. Yeah. Yes. Cool. I have a feeling it's going to be really advanced really soon. Uh, I was thinking we could like go through one of the sort of like introductory texts, like you know, uh, products limits, equalizers, all those sort of basic bits and pieces, first of all. Yeah, um, yeah questions? Is there any plans to target WebAssembly? Um, not directly, but the C++11 backend can successfully go via Enscript into WebAssembly. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you don't want to transpile twice, right? But right. you can do it. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to have a WebAssembly backend eventually if they figure out the GC thing. Um, I don't particularly want to write a garbage collector, though. You know, <laughs> um, my focus is mostly on like the JavaScript backend at the moment. I just want to make it possible for other people to write other backends. You know, um, yeah. What are the big things that you wish JavaScript had that has clients? GADTs, type families. I mean, I want them, but I don't want to implement them. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, what else? Sometimes laziness. I would like. I would really like to have something like, um, well, I don't know how this plays out in a practical language, but uh, there's this idea that you can have evaluation order polymorphism, right? Where I can write a program once that, sim that can simultaneously be lazy and strict, um, and I can sort of choose at the call site or I can defer the choice. I think that would be nice to experiment with, but um, it sort of doesn't play nicely with the no runtime requirement. Um, you can do something a little bit like that with libraries, but it gets a bit messy. Um, yeah, mostly JADTs type families. Uh, did you have a question? Just going to ask, um, how close is the JavaScript compiler um, to JFC? I mean, I know it's missing a few, I mean, it's missing features, but is it modeled at all on JFC? The implementation? The implementation organization? No. Um, 
so I mean I've read like the the typing Haskell in Haskell papers and I've read a lot of the papers that you know uh, describe the implementation but I haven't read the GHC implementation uh, specifically uh, it would be interesting yeah I probably I would like to get familiar with it even if just to make some contributions at some point but um, no it's it's not it's not directly based on it um, yeah. so, um, so when you started, what mm. part of the uh, compiler did you start writing first? Was it the sure. checker? So I, I had bits and pieces, right? So like, you know, um, every Haskeller eventually learns about Parsec and things, right? I had to write parsers. Um, I read the typing Haskell in Haskell paper, so I had bits and pieces of a type checker lying around. Um, code generation, um, you know, is string concatenation for all intents and purposes, right? So, um, you know, I had the basic pieces and then uh, when I started, I just took what I had and glued them together into the first prototype. Um, yeah, the the interesting bit that I didn't have was raw polymorphism. We had that sort of from the get-go. So, um, so yeah, most of the work initially was done on the type checker. So that was the piece I needed to do most on. Any more questions? No. Yeah. The, uh, how similar are the cores? Are the what? Sorry. The functional cores. Oh, um, yeah, so functional core is basically a little lambda calculus with um, records. Uh, and, oh, uh, I mean, so the functional core, um, I don't really know enough about GHC core to say. Um, they're both, you know, essentially lambda, calcula lambda calculi. Um, I think the GHC core has constraints now, like, uh, System FC, right? You got to have constraint uh, coercion, sorry, in the functional core. Um, obviously, we don't have that. Um, but you know, in the sense that they're both basically lambda calculus, they're quite similar, I suppose. I know GHC is yeah. typed as Chris Chris. No, it's not. Yeah. Um, I would like it to be typed. The problem is when with the elaboration semantics that we have in the type checker for type classes, um, I'm not exactly sure how to keep it typed and still be able to have that. Um, and also how you deal with scolums in the elaborate, because scolums then appear in the elaborated functional core, right? So I'm not, I'm sure it could be worked out. I just never really thought about it too much. But yeah. There's a paper called Tree Stack hey. Oh, have yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so you'd like attach stuff with functional right. type families or something. Like right? yeah. yeah, so that's, that's something we really, we really would like to have. So um, and having annotations of different types that appear on the on the different you know in the types and terms and things that can change as during the different compilation phases would be really great because what we have right now is basically like it's all one annotation type and we use like maybes or something to make sure and it, so it's not ideal the reason i did it that way was that i didn't have a good solution at the time that wouldn't be really uh, that wouldn't use some like really advanced haskell and i didn't want like i don't mind sort of like bits and pieces of the compiler depending on advanced Haskell, but I really don't want like the ADT, like the, the, the basic core of the compiler to have like advanced Haskell in it, because uh, I want people to contribute to it, right? So, um, but it's getting to the point where it's getting a little bit silly now. We're like passing around this like huge annotation type that has, you know, all the stuff we need. So uh, it might be time to look at a paper like that, yeah. Yeah. The, at what point do the, the other backends plug in? Do they, do they right. get access to the type information? So or do they just get the functional core? They don't get the type information right now. So the C11 backend. C won't work. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So the C11 backend um, actually is a fork of the compiler, right? So it was started before we added the ability to dump the functional core. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's still just a, a, a fork of the compiler, and it's probably not possible to have it work on the functional core. Uh, the functional core approach is pretty new. Like Most people haven't used it yet. The Erlang backend, I think, is also a fork. So, yeah. Any more? Will I ask no. question? I don't know if I'll be able to answer it, but sure. This is like a random mm -hmm. Nora inspiring kind of stream of thought question, mm -hmm. but um, the duplicate fields records. Hmm. I feel like I read a little about that in Evan's thesis. Is he not sure. that anywhere? Or, you know? I, I don't Those know. Records. I seem to remember at one point reading that he used the uh, extensible records with scope labels paper. Um, yeah, so yeah. it might, it may be, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. L now is just like JavaScript, and then it maps directly to JavaScript object, but you don't have 
Oh, that's right. Um, yeah, they changed that. Sorry, go ahead. So it's not scope labels anymore. They, they took out the addition, the field addition and deletion from the language. So it's just like your scripts. Okay. But do they, do they have duplicates, do you know? I don't um, know if they do. I, they, they actually are like so objects, aren't they? So. it's only used to model records. Like, yeah. you can't use ropes or anything else. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, good point. Okay. Do you have yep. an uh, yeah, I, uh, I think it's a great language. Like, um, okay. it's, it's, you know, a great way to learn. Well, sorry. I just thought it was pretty similar perspective. Yeah, um, I, I think it used to be the case that Elm was uh, UI focused, you know, and PureScript was building little DSLs focused. Um, and now, you know, PureScript can has a lot of libraries for building UIs. Um, and Elm has become a more general purpose language, right? No, they don't, they, not everything is based on FRP anymore even. Um, so, you know, the differences are more subtle now, right? Um, types, uh, sorry, uh, pure scripts, um, you know, I think it obviously has the more, in, you know, the more advanced type system features. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Elm is, Elm is a fantastic language for like learning you know, functional programming concepts in a pure functional language coming from JavaScript, right? Um, and we tend to find that eventually some of those users want some of the, you know, if they've used Haskell or whatever, they, they want to use those types of some features in a language like Elm and then they find pure scripts and, you know, they continue that way. Uh, and other users tend to just stick with Elm and it meets all their needs. Um, so I, you know, I like the fact that there's both. Um, no, it's been sort of sat a bit rotting for years at this point. Um, I would eventually really like to try the C++ backend uh, as an alternative because the problem wasn't that we couldn't implement it, it was just that it was horribly slow. Um, and it wasn't necessarily that PureScript generated very slow code, it was because we also tried it with JS, and they were like pretty much exactly the same speed. Um, it's just that JavaScript isn't really a great runtime for compilers, you know? Um, that's my opinion anyway. So um, yeah, I'd really like to try it with the C++ backend at some point and try to see if we can match the Haskell performance. And I don't think, I mean, Haskell's opt optimizer is amazing, right? So that's gonna be a tough job, but it'd be an interesting goal to have, but uh, it's, not the, it's not the focus at the moment. So you're, you're saying that you want to try and to write the compiler in C++? No, no, write the compiler in PureScript and use the C++ backend to convert it to an, a native executor. Yeah. yeah. Is there any, any sense of the performance difference between just somebody who really knows JavaScript and somebody who writes something sort of equivalent in PureScript? Um, is, it, is it basically the same speed, the same memory usage? So naive, you know, writing PureScript naively <laughs> because everything's, you know, the runtime, every function is carried, right, can result in some fairly, uh, you know, unoptimized JavaScript, but it's not the end of the world because usually, you know, a few function binds are not the bottleneck, right, when we're writing web applications. Um, if you need something that's really optimized, like, uh, so a good example is probably the virtual DOM thing, right, that you had. Um, there are tricks and it's, you know, there's some pretty hacky tricks you can use to get a fast, JavaScript out of the PureScript compiler if you really need very fast and like um, to the point where the virtual DOM, Nathan, you should probably just say like the. Uh, no, it's kind of a, I've kind of developed an, an art for coercing the compiler to give me the JavaScript that I want. So there's like all these like, you know, it's, it, it makes, for the most part, it, it's, you know, it's okay, it's kind of what you'd expect, but then like all the optimization, optimization would pretty much opt in. So it's like if you want to create functions, well then you can use this, you know, this special data type function data type that's not like the normal function data type, and call it, and it'll inline all the calls. So you you know you don't don't have that overhead, and like the at the inlining for f kind of removes all the binds and stuff. So it just looks like inherited JavaScript. So if you just stick to that kind of like very specific kind of like uh, effectful code, you know, it can be pretty fast, um, but it can still kind of because effects are values, and so they, anytime you want to run an effect, it also generates a closure for that effect, so that it can run it multiple times if you need it to, because it's, and it's a value. Um, that creates a lot of extra allocations in hot code, 
And so there's probably some other things we like. There's an optimization we want to do for what are called FFNs. So like the optimized function type is FN, just called FN, and it'll inline those call sites, and we can do the same optimization for effects, and it can inline the actual like effect at that point instead of creating another heap closure. And so that was that was that's the biggest bottom line. I wrote a virtual DOM library for it for our UI framework. And that was the, the garbage was the biggest issue, like part of really hot code. Mm -hmm. And um, effects were a big part of that. So we had to kind of uh, have to navigate that. You can be really, really fast code. You know, like that. But I think uh, for the most part, it's not a big deal. It's a lot faster than you think. And I think uh, writing idiomatic, it's funny because I've done a lot of performance testing too, and writing idiomatic pure strip code runs a lot better in Firefox. Like Firefox, for whatever reason, is really good at optimizing the kind of code that we generate. Versus like Chrome is really good at optimizing code that a JavaScript person would write, and uh, so it's like when I write the the kind of like the when I'm trying to coerce the compiler to write the optimized code, Chrome optimizes that a lot better. But if you just write any kind of code, Firefox optimizes. What about Firefox? I don't know. Can you run it? Yeah, and there is. Um, so there's a roll-up plugin. Roll-up's just a bundler. And there's a roll-up plugin out there that will do that for you. It'll, it'll generate inline versions of function, or you know, uncurried versions of function. And uh, like when you when you go to bundle like the pure script output, it'll parse the pure script output and insert uh, uncurried versions of functions. Um, but last time I tried to use it, um, there was a parser issue. The JavaScript part that you're using, it wouldn't parse some of our output to I don't know, just kind of weird. But um, we haven't used it at scale yet, so I don't know how well it works or how or what the speed difference is like. I guess it's I guess you can't really do it if you have like a library or something other things you have. No, because it's all you can because it's a it's a single pass bundler at that stage. You've already compiled it, you have all of your blobs, and so it, it's bundling your entire program, and since it's doing since you're able to bundle the entire program, it can do the whole program analysis. Okay. Alright, thanks. Okay.